Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for joining. Today I'm going to take a quick look at the 108 year balance sheet history for the Federal Reserve, that is the Central Bank of the United States. So this is 108 years of history. The Federal Reserve Act was passed uh, in December 1913. They opened their doors in 1914. And thanks to the Center for Financial Stability, I've mentioned them before. I've mentioned Mr. Barnett, the economist, uh, one of the chief economists there, also used to work at the Federal Reserve. Uh, thanks to them for collecting this very detailed weekly balance sheet data. The Federal Reserve themselves only publishes balance sheet data back to 2002. You have to go deeper to other sources to find it, but uh, they made it quite easy at the Center for Financial Stability. So we have a 108 year history now of the weekly balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And as you might remember, as I always say, um, with long term things such as Bitcoin, you can't really see what's happening here in earlier years unless, of course, you look at the tooltip. So it's much easier to look at this stuff on log scale. So that's what I'm going to do right now log left. Now this is in log scale. And we have some trend lines here. I'm going to take them off for now. Let's just look at the balance sheet. What is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet? Well, uh, when I say that, of course, I'm referring to total assets, the total assets that they hold on their balance sheet. What does it mean the Federal Reserve's total assets? Well, it's everything that they buy in the marketplace with their printed money. Now, in the Federal Reserve's case, the Central Bank of the United States, the overwhelming majority of their assets are government bonds, government bills, government notes, government bonds of a wide variety of duration. Uh, I talked about duration risk in the last two videos, which many banks around the United States and around the world are suffering from right now with rising interest rates. Do check that out. But uh, here's how it looks from the level of the central bank, what they actually hold, their total assets. These are primarily government bonds that they purchase with the money that they print. Now, you would not be completely incorrect. In fact, I'm totally fine with it. I've said it myself uh, to also refer to this as the printing press. Okay. Uh, as I just said, these are the assets that they own with the money that they print. However, it's not 100% correct. Sometimes you're 90% correct. Sometimes you're 80% correct. Um, it depends on how they define the money, which doesn't exist on the asset side of their balance sheet. In the central bank's case, as with any bank's case, actually, when you measure money, you're looking at liabilities you're looking at the liability portion of that bank's balance sheet. It is no different with the central bank. So these are assets, total assets. But as I said, the printed money that they use to buy these assets, that is located on the liability portion. And there's also capital. There's also a few other things. Uh, there's also uh, a big item in the central bank of the United States' case called the reverse repurchase agreement, which is kind of like printed money for non-banks. Typically, we're talking about printed money for banks. So there is some nuance there. Uh, when you look at the asset side, it's kind of the cleaner way to look at what the Federal Reserve does. But uh, as you may know, I do with the monetary base updates every quarter. I just talked about that yesterday with my buddy Marty on his show, uh, TFTC. Base money is the liability portion. I am showing you here the asset portion. Uh, directionally, they're the same. They're always going to move in the same direction. But there are some, some, some nuances there, some things to point out. And I will do that for you, actually, in, uh, in the next video. But for now, I just want to look at total assets that the Federal Reserve holds. And this is a 108-year history on a weekly basis. Finally, one more thing about the assets that they can buy. Yes, it's typically government bonds. As I've mentioned in prior videos, the bond markets, the debt markets, they dwarf equity markets. The bond markets are what it's all about as far as the financial world goes. It also happens to be where the most monopolized player 
in the market is, i.e. the central bank. And so yes, the majority of the assets here are government bonds, but that doesn't have to be the case. As many well-known uh, classical liberal economists have said uh, throughout the prior decades, throughout the prior hundred years, there's no limitation on what central banks can buy with their printed money. If I were to show you uh, the assets of say the Bank of Japan, or the Swiss National Bank, you would find not just government bonds there, but you would also find stocks, Facebook stock, Apple stock, the Federal Reserve as well. They don't just have uh, general United States treasuries. They have mortgage backed securities that they purchased, which were very uh, poorly issued from a government agency. It is true. Um, but nonetheless, this is real estate based debt which is unique, and they didn't have that at all on their balance sheet prior to 2008, prior to the global financial crisis in 2008. So they can buy whatever they want. They don't have to buy government securities. Uh, cent other central banks around the world indeed have bought stocks, but Reserve indirectly owns real estate. Yes, there are some laws and statutorily things that uh, they should buy, but at the end of the day, uh, the Fed is going to do what it sees best. I'm not defending them. I'm saying what they see best for the economy and for money printing. And uh, they will buy whatever they need to buy according to uh, history. Uh, nothing really can stop them. So that's something to keep in mind. Yes, the vast majority of what you see here are United States government treasuries, but that is not necessarily indeed Probably you can, with fair certainty, say that this won't be just limited to government securities in the future. Also gold, of course, I can say that's another asset on their balance sheet. Um, that used to be a much larger portion of their total balance sheet. Uh, historically, of course, it was a much larger portion of any bank's balance sheet historically as an asset, asset that they held on their books. Uh, the United States has a very weird gold certificate account. I don't want to get into it in this video, but um, you know, some people say the gold isn't even there. Uh, regardless, gold is uh, statutorily listed at $42 an ounce or so on their book. So it's very, very low. Even if you took it at face value, how much gold they actually did have, they don't value it according to the market. So. Gold is a very small, insignificant portion, at least as far as the Federal Reserve values that gold on their balance sheet, if indeed it is there. So that's what this is. This is the Federal Reserve balance sheet over the last 108 years, and this is on log scale. So base 10 here, we're going from 1 billion to 10 billion to 100 billion. Every uh, level up here on the log scale is 10, a multiple of 10 higher. And we can see here, Federal Reserve opened their doors in 1914. They had 0.25 billion, 0.6 billion dollars worth of a balance sheet. What does that mean? That means 600 million, 650 million dollars worth or so of assets. Uh, they did jump above a billion here relatively quickly uh, towards the end of World War I. And then as the Roaring Twenties started, they actually cooled off a little bit. There was a depression here in 1920, 21. Tom Woods has talked about this. Uh, they were not actually printing so much here. And then of course, Ben Bernanke thinks they didn't do enough at the start of the Great Depression. But you see, it didn't take long for them to print more money. And again, I'm going to use that word print money to buy assets in the marketplace. Um, not too much longer after the onset of the Great Depression. And they continued this all the way until the end of World War. Uh, two, and then the founding of what was known as the Bretton Woods Conference, which basically had a new dollar standard implemented by the victors of World War II all around the world. The dollar standard really started here. Uh, gold standard was done here basically even by World War I. We were on a gold exchange standard all through this point, even through Bretton Woods, where basically uh, central banks could still hold gold, and they still hold gold today, of course, but. Uh, most of that made its way into the United States, 70% plus of all central bank gold because of the fascist dictators, uh, Stalin, Hitler, and Mussolini in Europe. Uh, most of the gold made its way into the United States. So um, the United States held most of the world's gold from this point. 
and uh, the rest of the central banks, they would reserve dollars. And if they really wanted to get their gold, they could, which is what Charles de Gaulle, I did a whole video on this, Charles de Gaulle uh, famously claimed on the Federal Reserve here at the end of the 60s. And by August 15th, 1971, it was too much. The Nixon shock occurred. Richard Nixon said, no, let's close the gold window. Uh, no more gold redemptions for any central banks around the world. And from this point, we went on to basically a pure fiat standard around the world. And things actually seemed, this was also known as the great moderation here. Uh, for 20, uh, 30 years or so, things seemed okay. Uh, balance sheet was growing at a, you know, let's say a normal clip seemed pretty stable. Maybe the Federal Reserve was starting to figure out what was going on. People didn't need gold. Gold wasn't a big deal. Barbarous relic. Federal Reserve must have known what they were doing, right? You did have some hiccups here. Uh, what's this? Little bump. This is Y2K. People demanded more cash in uh, fears of the Y2K Unix bug, uh, but it didn't occur, of course, and uh, nothing happened. But this was what this jump in the balance sheet was. September 11th, 2001. Uh, but generally, you see that the uh, balance sheet increases at, let's say, a normalized clip. Until, of course, here. But of course, here. The global financial crisis occurred. And, you know, I'm not going to fully answer th these why questions, right, uh, on these videos, but clearly something wasn't right. So the Federal Reserve, as Ben Bernanke told Milton Friedman uh, in the late 90s, I believe, uh, before he was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, that uh, the Federal Reserve didn't do enough during the Great Depression and they, the Federal Reserve, would never make that mistake again. That's what he said. And so um, he followed through with his word. They had massive market intervention, massive money printing on the liability side to buy bad assets that banks, uh, bets basically, that banks had taken on their asset side. Just, you know, don't worry about those losses. We'll take them off your books. That's what they said. And they bought bad assets here, mortgage-backed securities. They even had some corporate bailouts here. Uh, those went away uh, after a year or so, but they did have a lot of corporate bailouts at this point and um, took on more treasuries, took on more mortgage-backed securities to the tune of trillions of dollars on their books. And so now you see where the total balance sheet, that is, i.e., the total assets of the Federal Reserve, before the GFC, $900 billion, immediately uh, within a few months, they had more than doubled that. $2.2 trillion uh, cooled off a little bit, but this was what became known as QE1. I'm going to reset the zoom. Let's go look just to the global financial crisis here. QE1. Then they markets, you know, every time that Ben Bernanke would start to uh, signal a taper, as they called it. The markets would have a taper tantrum, uh, just like a little kid wanted more stimulus, wanted the punch bowl to come back. And so he would, of course, oblige. And this was known as QE2, more bond buying, more money printing. And this was known as QE3, more bond buying, more money printing. Now, I don't defend anything the Federal Reserve here did, but if you're a Bitcoiner uh, and you've been around this space as long as I have, plenty of Bitcoiners were saying that the Central Bank of the United States, in particular, prints too much money. We print, print, print. This is why Bitcoin, we print, print, print. The Federal Reserve of the United States has not printed from this point. From mid-2014, there was no printing. Okay, as you can see, the balance sheet stayed flat, and then it even started to go down, normalized, as they called it. Uh, again, I don't defend what they do, but let's try to be precise. Let's try to understand no money was being printed, as we call it, the printing press, the Central Bank of the United States, they are the printing press, whether physically, CBPC, or digitally, which is called bank reserves. That's wholesale digital cash for banks. We also have, of course, CBDC. That's all the rave these days. There's only about 10, 11 operating around the world. That would also be on their balance sheet as a liability, the mirror opposite of what you see here. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve does not have a CBDC. Uh, people have erroneously called Fed now a CBDC, which is coming this summer. That is not a CBDC. That is just a payment rail for bank deposits. Nonetheless, let's be precise. Uh, if you want to talk about the printing press, if you want to talk about central bank physical currency, digital currency, bank reserves, wholesale cash, retail cash, uh, that's going to mirror this number, basically, on the liability side of their balance sheet. And as you see, 
it was not going up. There was no money printing. Yet Bitcoiners would say again, again and again and again here that the central bank was printing money they were not. I'm not defending what they do. I'm not defending the mess that, of course, they got us into, uh, but they were not printing here. And then, of course, COVID. Uh, you had here uh, what was called the repo hiccup, and they needed to basically print more money for non-banks um, in the repo market. That's all I'll say about that right here. And then, of course, when we get to COVID, the real stimulus happened. Um, so they've they reversed it in two ways. They started to reverse it already here in late 2019. And then once COVID came, the world collectively lost its mind and the central bank printed another, let's just, let's count it out, right? Let's even zoom it in. We were at $4.1 trillion, a thousand billion is a trillion, $4.1 trillion. And in the span of a few weeks, we went up to seven. So and probably, yeah, three trillion, three trillion dollars in the span of a few weeks, uh, a few months during COVID-19, 2020. That was the COVID stimulus. You'll note that they didn't call this QE4. They just called it COVID stimulus. And uh, many things happened here. Now there's no reserve requirements for banks. Um, things just get weirder and weirder. Anyway, the point is the last two weeks. Okay, so... We have uh, tapering again that the Fed was going to try to normalize their balance sheet, uh, take away the punch bowl, take away the stimulus and the free money that they gave to banks. And again, primarily this stuff goes to banks, which I'll talk more about in the future. Uh, there is physical cash that they print for us, but that, that, uh, that didn't quite happen really ever where there's like a massive just helicopter money of physical cash. Uh, it is true that there were treasury, uh, extra support for the treasury to issue more stimulus checks, which did eventually make its way into the retail economy, which is why they're raising rates now. Nonetheless, uh, this is where they decided to cool off, not print any more money and actually lower the balance sheet as well. And again, how do you do that? Well, you do that by selling your assets back into the marketplace that you bought before. And when you do that, you're going to actually take the cash that you printed before and take it away and burn it. That's what they do. And that will also have the effect of a rising interest rate. I've talked about this in the last two videos that has proven to be extremely painful for many banks around the world. It bankrupted uh, Silicon Valley Bank, SVB Bank, to where now, again, we've gotten to the point where they were trying to normalize, trying to lower the balance sheet. And over the last two weeks, let's look at March 8th levels. It was actually slightly more the, the the SVB news started right around this time, March 8th, um, a little bit after March 8th, March 1st to March 8th. We, they did go up a little bit. Uh, let's just zoom in for you. March 1st, they were actually fully, you know, normalizing, still going down, down tapering. Uh, but the market said, no, we're having a taper tantrum. So they started to increase just a little bit here. March 8th, they went up just, you know, a few billion dollars, a few billion dollars. But then here, of course, last week, Wednesday end, they went up $300 billion. And as of yesterday, which they uh, released their Wednesday day end balance sheet, uh, which is one week later, they went up another $100 billion. So if we reset the zoom again, and we see what they were trying to taper from here, from you know, mid-2022, uh, Jerome Powell's famous Jackson Hole speech of last summer where we knew that rate rises were coming, pain was coming, taper tantrums were going to come from banks. Uh, they didn't actually hit $9 trillion. Must have been a voodoo number for them. They almost hit it. $8.95 trillion balance sheet. They did not hit $9 trillion, But they cut off $600 billion dollars worth of their balance sheet in a year's time in a year's time and in two weeks now they have put back 400 billion
So money printing, taper tantrums, market intervention, that is the name of the game for the Federal Reserve. Uh, try to look at it from a bird's eye view, try to be precise. This is their balance sheet over the last 100 years. Now, as you know, I love to draw trend lines, show you real statistical numbers based on all of the 5,600 weeks or so of data that we have right here. The best fitting regression trend line for the Federal Reserve, as in many markets, is going to be exponential. Not power like Bitcoin, certainly not linear or logarithmic, um, but an exponential regression trend line. I'm going to draw it right now. And we're on log scale, remember. So how is an exponential trend line going to look on log scale? Straight line. Exponential trend lines are a straight line on log scale. There it is. And we can do percentile bands as well. Show you one sigma down, one sigma up. I will show that in just a second. But uh, notice here that this takes in every single week's worth of data. Okay, so when they started, they were like way under all-time trend. All right, the black line is all-time trend, all-time trend. They were way under all-time trend here back in 1914, you know, a couple hundred million dollars worth of uh, total assets on their balance sheet. Then they went over it under over and then really the interesting thing here is they were way under from you know the 60s from the start of the 60s end of the 50s all the way until the gfc they were under the all-time trend and then of course we had the explosion that i just explained of the balance sheet the money printing okay when you say the printing press the money printing qe one two three COVID stimulus and then this recent you know blip up again uh if I showed you an all-time trend before the GFC, it would be much more flat. It would be much less steep. But since I got to take into account, of course, the last 15 years of money printing, this takes the all-time trend line up. So when we think about the future, um, actually, you can certainly make the case that I should only draw a trend line from here, which is just a, proven to be a whole new era of money printing, stimulus, uh, bailouts, all the rest, you know, socialized losses. This is a new era. You can just see it with your eyes compared to anything that happened here. Yes, we were above trend in uh, World War II. This is very true. Okay, this is very true. And, and you can say that this compares to this trend and that we're above trend here. We've been above trend here. But something tells me this is not going to normalize like we had here in uh, what was called the great moderation. Just something tells me that that's not gonna be the case. Nonetheless, I'm not gonna make it more extreme. I'm not gonna only draw the trend line from here, from this period, from the GFC period. I'm gonna, I, I am, as you see, using all of the data. So keep that in mind when we start to draw these percentile bands and we start to project where this can go in the future. Okay, so that's that's leads me to, to looking at predictions into the future. As always, when I say prediction, this is a statistical term based on the trend line. I have no idea what the Fed's balance sheet will be next week, you know, likely up. But what we can do is look at this all time trend line. And interestingly, the all time trend line, again, because we have 5,600 plus weeks worth of data here, we have 108 years worth of data. Uh, the trend line is, is much more shallow. It's much less steep than what has happened in the last 15 years. So the trend line is only, uh, as of the 22nd of March, 2023, $4 trillion, $4 trillion, whereas the balance sheet itself is now $8.7 trillion. So more than double the actual number versus trend. Again, I, I could make a much steeper trend for you, only look at the last 15 years, I'm not gonna do that. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. So now we start to uh, to project out where will trend be based on the entirety of the Federal Reserve historical data over the last 108 years. By 2030, we've looked at this for other assets, particularly Bitcoin. Based on an exponential trend, by 2030, Christmas, you're going to have a $7 trillion balance sheet on exponential regression trend line of 96% R squared, which is an incredibly well-behaved, goodness of fit, a very, very good, strong R squared. 96% R squared, $7 trillion by 2030. Again, where are we today? 8.7, 8.7. So it shows you uh, 
how much more shallow the money printing was before the GFC versus after. That's what it shows you because the trend line here, it takes into account 108 years of data. This, you know, th this, um, this action here only happened in the last 15 years, right? It was completely different before the GFC. So that's something to keep in mind. And it's something to keep in mind when I show you uh, these one sigma down and two sigma down and up trend lines, which I'm going to do right now. So one sigma, what is that? Basically, every time you look at this trend line now, anything within the blue bands will happen two thirds of the time. Two thirds of the time, that is data within these blue bands. So now we can start to see that outside of a one sigma move happened, well, it happened here during uh, the start of Bretton Woods and after World War II. And it also happened a little bit here at the start of the Roaring Twenties. And it happened, of course, here. After the GFC, QE3 took us over a one sigma move all time. And then, of course, COVID took us over a one sigma move all time. And based on all time trend, we're nowhere near right now. Again, this is log scale. So what's the one sigma move up? One sigma move up, it's $6.8 trillion. Based on all time trend, where are we? 8.7 trillion, $600 billion higher than we were two weeks ago. We're nowhere near normalizing to a within a one sigma move of historical trend. We're nowhere near it. Two trillion dollars higher. Let's look at two sigma. Two sigma. What does two sigma mean? It means all data that's within these red bands will occur. If you see data that is the balance sheet total assets between these red bands, that's going to be a 95 percentile event. 95% of the time, the data will fall between these red bands. So now we can see that QE3, based on the all time trend, wasn't a two sigma event, yet the COVID stimulus was. And let's go back in time to see how the World War II, post World War II Bretton Woods era looked like just a little bit here in the 40s, just just after World War II. Uh, we were over trend, you know, their balance sheet was 44 billion dollars trend was 20 of course we were well over trend but the two sigma up trend 43 billion dollars so we were a billion dollars over it there and again what does that mean it just means very rare error very rare rare value based on the all-time trend it's only five percent of the observations are outside of this red band two and a half percent above the top red band two and a half percent below the bottom red band that's how it works and of course, the rest of the two sigma down only occurs basically here when the Fed was trying to understand what they were even doing, uh, just printing money and starting up their monopolized printing press at the uh, when they opened their doors in 1914 till the end of World War One. So that's how it looks. That is the 108 year all time trend line of the United States Federal Reserve. One thing I want to say again about all of this stuff is um, Compound annual growth rate analogizes perfectly with exponential trend lines. It doesn't exactly with the power trend line, which I was showing you uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, exponential growth moves differently than a power trend line, but this is exponential growth. It's roughly a straight line on log scale. Again, if we take it off log, you see you can't even understand anything. Log scale much easier over the long term. Uh, two little bits of data to throw at you as I close this video. Uh, you can measure the exponential growth in two ways here over the long term. One, let's say when the Federal Reserve had $250 million worth of their balance sheet starting when they opened the doors, $250 million worth of assets. Now they have uh, $8.73 trillion. How do you compare those things? Well, you just run a PV analysis, present value, future value. Uh, if you compare those numbers way back 108 years ago with this number now uh, in 2023, what's the compound annual growth rate there? 10.2%, 10.2%. And we can also compare this, as I've mentioned, certainly much more shallow trend line compared to the last 15 years, but the all time trend line here, which is shallow relative to the last 15 years, what is the compound annual growth rate of the trend line itself to where we, we were in 1914? The trend line was uh, 2 billion 
dollars. Two billion dollars was the trend line of their all-time assets. And today, here it's uh, again, it's it's uh, four point one trillion dollars. What's the compound annual growth rate of that over 108 years? For that, it is 7.7%. So 7.7% compound annual growth rate for the all-time trend line, 10.2% compound annual growth rate for the balance sheet itself, based on present value, future value formula. Uh, that sort of makes sense as well. You can see that obviously we're in a two sigma up move here. So clearly the balance sheet itself is growing much faster in the last 15 years, as I mentioned over trend. Uh, and how would we also look at those two numbers, 10.2% versus 7.7%? Well, they're actually conveniently right around the rule of 72. So 10.2% uh, compounded for the all-time balance sheet. Okay, the green, what does that mean? That means the Fed's balance sheet of the last 108 years doubled every 7.2 years. 10% compounded growth will double every 7.2 years and actually works the opposite for the trend. The trend is 7.7. .7. Again, I'm just I'm just going by the rule of 72 here. Just I'm not looking at any figures. 7.2% uh, compounded per year. Again, this is 7.7. .7. That would double how often? Every 10 years. So interesting there. The trend line shows that the Fed's balance sheet will double every 10 years. But if you look at the actual figures, the actual balance sheet, and run the present value formula of that, it actually over the last 108 years has doubled every seven years. So there you go. That is the compound annual growth rate and exponential regression trend line of the entire Federal Reserve's balance sheet over the last 108 years. Thanks for watching.